these ideas about social reconstruction and personal reorientation may be criticized as solutions to non-existent problems. Yet there are problems, almost universally shared within the world, that help set the stage for these large transformative projects. The first such problem is the failure of contemporary societies to fulfill the promise of a modicum of economic prosperity and independence for the masses of ordinary men and women. The majority of the human race remains consigned to economically dependent and even oppressive wage labor, a form of wage labor that continues the practices of slavery or of serfdom under the external form of free contract. Most people in the labor force throughout the world do the repetitious work that machines could execute. The desire not to stand in another person's shadow, not to be subject to another man's will, is almost nowhere realized as the normal form of economic life. The second problem is that the message of the worldwide popular romantic culture, the message that every ordinary person has within him, the spark of the divine, is dishonored in the practice of social life. All the contemporary societies continue to deny to the majority of people the educational equipment that they need in order to develop and to deepen their subjective life, to make good on the idea that there is more than them than there is in the structure of society and of culture that they inhabit. The third problem is that the desire of nations throughout the world to be different, to develop the powers and possibilities of humanity in different directions remains unequipped. Two peoples that live close together come to hate one another all the more, not because they are different, but because they're alike and will to be different. The impotent rage of the will to difference in the presence of the waning of actual difference gives to contemporary nationalism its characteristically poison tone. The solution is not to retreat into an empty cosmopolitanism. The solution is to equip the will to difference with the instruments for the creation of actual difference. A fourth problem is that the world political and economic order developed in the aftermath of the Second World War, rather than facilitating heresy, experiment, divergence, possibility, attempts to impose on all of humanity a single institutional formula in the name of political security and of economic openness. Globalization has developed as a straitjacket imposed on humanity to restrict the development of the experiments on which our future depends. 
A fifth problem is that our desire to make sense of our lives and to reckon with the irremediable flaws in the human condition, our mortality, our groundlessness, and our insatiability is characteristically met not by ideas that recognize those flaws and that show us how we can have a greater life despite them, but rather by lullabies that deny those flaws. Sometimes narratives, narratives of a divine intervention in history in which we find ourselves increasingly unable to believe. And sometimes by stories of historical transformation, such as the social theories of Karl Marx that claim history to be on our side and progress to be inevitable. These lullabies may arouse the will temporarily, but they corrupt the imagination and deflect us from our course. We do not need lullabies. More than ever, we need enlightenment. We need to confront these problems, to see them for what they are, and on their basis, to define the project of a greater life.